Hi, happy Monday. I hope you're having a great time. We're having a fantastic time here at Steiner. This is The Wife of Caesar. My name is Michel Levien or Michel Levien. Either is fine. And welcome to The Wife of Caesar. The Wife of Caesar is Steiner's project to talk about corruption using everyday words, using ordinary language so that we can fight corruption in our day-to-day -day actions with a little bit more than just uh, good intentions. Okay, awesome. As with every program, we're going to have a new section. We're going to deal with a case and we're going to talk about a typology, which we will explain a, a little bit more uh, down the line. Fantastic. Let's move on to the news. Our piece of news today uh, is about the, the, the appointment of Miss Yasmin Esquivel Mosa to, to serve as a justice, or we would say a minister, ministra, as a justice of the Supreme Court of Mexico. She was appointed, um, Dr. Esquivel was appointed uh, maybe about a couple of days ago by the Senate, and the, se the Mexican Senate ratified her to serve a 15-year term to serve as a, as a justice in the Supreme Court. Now, for those of you who don't know, as in many countries, um, we have a, a powers are separate, are divided into three. We have a, an executive power, a legislative power, and a judicial power. They essentially decide things. And the highest court or the highest authority in that judicial power is the Supreme Court. The, each, the, in Mexico, our Supreme Court is composed by 11, 11 justices or 11 ministers, and Dr. Esquivel has been appointed to serve as one. Now, she has been ratified to serve for 15 years, and doc, Dr. Esquivel has, a, uh, has had an outstanding career of 35 years working in the public sector, of which 25 years have been spent in adjudication. That means that she's worked for different organs or different bodies of government, uh, whose sole purpose is judging things, deciding whether or not uh, the law applies in a particular way. This is actually a fantastic thing. And as for her um, credentials, Dr. Esquivel is a PhD in law. She is an expert in administrative law. She is an expert in tax law. And she is an expert in constitutional law, which plays a major role in her appointment as uh, a justice to the Supreme Court. Because as most of you might know, constitutional law deals with the application of human rights and how human rights are protected by courts from um, the wrongdoing of government or from improper laws. So this is very important. So very clearly she has a background and she has uh, extensive expertise in, in the matter. Now, why in a, pro in a program that is devoted to corruption or to anti-corruption are we discussing an appointment of, of this particular, the appointment of this particular minister? Because she has been questioned in, in the media uh, for many reasons, and the main reason is her relation, her personal relationship with a contractor that is very close to the president of, of Mexico. She is married to Juan Jose Maria Riobo, who is, uh, has, been, has served as a, a counselor or an advisor to President López Obrador for quite some time, uh, even before, before the actual presidential campaign, and is now a con who is now a contractor for the federal government. Again, Dr. Esquivel is very qualified and her credentials are impeccable, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to taint that or to merely try to qualify her by who she is related to or married to. But it is our job to never, never stop paying attention to possible conflicts of interest. As you know, a conflict of interest is when the interest of one person goes one way or lies in one place and the interest of the organization for which she works goes in a different way. This by itself is not a bad thing, but when the time comes to make a, a valuable decision, it stands to reason that that person might decide uh, in line with her interests and against the interest of the organization, which is to the detriment of every Mexican. Is this corruption? Maybe. Depends. As you might remember, corruption is the abuse of, of an entrusted position for private gains or improper gains. Now, the entrusted position in this particular case would be the appointment as a, as a justice or a minister of the Supreme Court, and the private or improper gains have not uh, materialized, and let's hope that they, they never do, but if they do, this might become an act of corruption. Why is this important? Because we, we are supposed, modern democracies are supposed to have the, these, this notion of checks and balance, balances, which means that no one person can wield too much power. 
Um, this is achieved, uh, at least in Mexico, by the separation of powers, by dividing the powers into executive, legislative, and judicial. And in this particular case, we have a member of the highest court of the land, the judicial power or the judiciary, who is directly related to a person who is interested or who has a friendship, a close friendship with the president. Is there independence? Let's hope. But th it is something that we need to pay attention to. Okay, so let's move on to the case. Our case today deals with telecom. And I, I happen to be a, a close follower of the work of Ma Mike Kaler of FCPA Professor. Uh, you, can, you can check out his work at fcpaprofessor.com. And he re very recently wrote about how several telecom companies have reached settlements with the United States government for a staggering amount of money. And that, that motivated us to talk about how that works. Okay, now... First, I'd like to give you a bit of a bit of a background. Mike Kaler at FCPA Professor mainly talks about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is just the, the the official name of the specific law of the U.S. that punishes bribery or for, bribery paid uh, abroad in foreign places. If you go outside of the country and pay a bribe, then that law applies to you. So don't do that. Okay, now. He very recently wrote about how FCPA uh, settlements, uh, or about the FCPA settlements that have been reached by three telecom companies. Companies, uh, the companies are Vimplecom, Telia, and MTS, which we have discussed very recently. Why, why that's important is because these companies uh, combined have reached settlements with the United States government for about $1.7 billion. Now, let's step back a little bit. And what are these settlements? Th these these settlements are, are a way for the government to solve problems or to solve cases without having to do an entire investigation and without having to take the, the whole thing to court. Um, the, what, what this achieves is that it saves resources and it saves valuable time, uh, valuable taxpayer money and valuable taxpayer time. Great. How do these work? Well, first we have two types of settlements. They are called non-prosecution agreements and deferred prosecution agreements. You don't have to worry too much about what they mean. Essentially, it means either the government says, I will not prosecute you if you do X, Y, and Z, or I will defer, I will delay prosecution, uh, taking you to court if you do X, Y, and Z. Eventually, both might end in not going to court. Again, these are a good thing. They are generally considered a good thing, and most of them are uh, beyond reproach. They are not abused. But what's tricky here is that these settlements are not subject to judicial review. Judicial review is lawyer speak for a judge will check your work to make sure that everything is okay, that, that everything is transparent. In most countries that uh, apply non-prosecution agreements or deferred prosecution agreements, extrajudicial settlements, courts have to review them and approve them. And they do this because when a court uh, approves it or reviews it, the court has to make a decision that either, either a particular judge or uh, a couple of magistrates have to make a decision and say, well, this agreement is good because of this and this and that, or it is bad because of this and this and that. And those decisions become binding precedent. Binding precedent is a fancy, wor a fancy way of saying this is what you have to do next time. The next time somebody does that, they have to follow what the court decided the previous time. Here, not so much. In the case of the U.S., the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission, who are the main enforcers of this particular law, do not have to subject their agreements, their settlements, to a judge. No judge, no court has to review them and approve them. The problem with this is that because this happens, very few cases uh, of foreign bribery under the FCPA are ever taken to court. And therefore, very few decisions on the FCPA are made. So really, we have very little guidance on, uh, as to what the actual text of the law means. When, when judges make decisions, they make things clearer and clearer. And as uh, the, the, the application of the law moves along in time, people have some certainty as to what they can expect from a judge. In this case, so many, so very few cases have been tried before a court that companies don't really know what's the worst that could happen. And, and major companies, public companies that trade in stock exchanges hate this. This is risk, this represents uncertainty, and this represents the, the possibility of losing a lot and a lot of money. So 
in order to avoid it's it's kind of a, a catch 22 or a vicious cycle in order in order to avoid a, a, a more severe penalty or the uncertainty of a more severe severe penalty they opt or they decide to make an agreement with the government and that agreement is not reviewed by a court and therefore the next person to be uh, investigated is going is will have no way of knowing what's the worst that can happen so they again decide to sign an agreement and so on and so forth this by itself again it's not a bad thing but it could be better most modern democracies most countries that apply this type of law against foreign bribery including mexico and for example france even though they have relatively new statutes relatively uh, new laws they do apply judicial review to to these contracts or these types of agreements so that people get more certainty and the law becomes clear as they go it, it, it is important to note that the fcpa has been uh, in force since the 70s the 1970s and for example france's law came into force in 2015 and they already have have had uh, some judicial opinions on, on the way they do agreements so in this particular case even though the u.s does extremely well in prosecution and investigations and determinant of corruption they are doing very poorly in adjudication and in stating in clearly stating what the law is okay so let's move on to the typology as we know typology is an example a model or an iteration of a specific phenomenon if, we if we're talking about corruption, a typology for corruption would be the specific or concrete steps that you take uh, to commit a corrupt act. Okay, today we will talk about fake theft or sometimes called simulated theft. Simulated theft is a way to dissociate money or resources from scrutiny in order to use them to commit uh, uh, an act of corruption, particularly to pay a bribe. So what happens is a company will report a theft and uh, this this particular theft never ha never happened and they go to the authorities and claim that somebody or you know somebody stole uh goods money or both and then that money is somewhat accounted for and now the company has an excuse or a justification for missing that money and they take that money and they give it to a public official they use it to pay a bribe now, the problem with this, or the major issue with fake theft, is that it necessitates the commission of other crimes. And it, it is very similar uh, by itself to money laundering in that in money, money laundering, you take dirty money and you make it appear as clean money. Here, you're doing the exact opposite. You're taking clean money and you're lying to the authorities in order to, to remove that money from scrutiny or those resources from scrutiny, and you're devoting that money to the commission of a crime. So it's a very severe crime. But... Uh, obviously, the consequences could be that could be very, very severe, severe. But you have a perfect excuse for having money that's off the books and using that money to pay bribes to a public official or to a third party, and thus securing uh, an improper benefit. Okay, so that was all for today. Thank you for joining us at The Wife of Caesar. My name, again, is Michel Levien or Michel Levien. Either is fine. Okay, so as usual, I'd like to leave you with this. Corruption should be reported, yes, but always do so safely. Please stay safe. If you feel for whatever reason that you are not exactly or entirely safe, or if you're not sure whether or not what you're witnessing is an act of corruption, refrain from reporting. Uh, approach someone who might be able to help. Feel free to write us at info at strider.mx and we will be glad to help you in any way we can, but please stay safe. Okay, so thank you. This was the Wife of Caesar and have a great week.